Our first speaker is a pioneer on prostitution research. Her name is Melissa Farley. She's a non-academic research psychologist who thinks trafficking only happens when there's some place to traffic women to. Strip clubs, escort prostitution, massage brothels. She thinks there's an inextricable connection between prostitution and sex trafficking, and she's going to talk about that. She's written a new book, Prostitution and Trafficking in Nevada, Making the Connections. I hear she's resorted to cartoons to complement research data in that book. Maybe we'll see some of them today. By the way, I take full credit for getting Melissa into book publishing. I edited her first book, which is now in its third printing, and is being used in many college courses across the U.S. and in other countries. The name of the book? Prostitution, Trafficking, and Traumatic Stress, published by Hayworth Press in 2003, simultaneously published as two special issues of the Journal of Trauma Practice, recently renamed the Journal of Psychological Trauma, not coincidentally a journal that I co-edit. So I'm very pleased and honored to introduce to you Dr. Melissa Farman. Um, thank you for coming. I'm going to talk about false distinctions in the field of trafficking for prostitution, about denial, and about the issue of consent and choice, which is one aspect of denial, that whole debate about choice and voluntariness. And I'll end by talking about some wonderful UN agreements that challenge these false distinctions between prostitution and trafficking. Trafficking happens whenever men, women, or children are recruited and then exploited in the sex industry. Prostitution is the destination point for trafficking. The sex industry, like any other industry, has domestic and international sectors. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Um, uh, international and domestic sectors, marketing sectors, a range of physical locations out of which it operates in each community, and it's controlled by many different managers and owners. It's constantly expanding as technology, law, and public opinion permit. The false distinction between prostitution and trafficking puts both victims and law enforcement in an impossible bind. For example, my colleague Alicia Adams in Atlanta joked to me about services for prostituted teens in Atlanta. What do I have to do in order to get some help here, she said. Take these girls across the border in a bus, then bring them back into the U.S. and say, here, I've got some traffic girls. Now can we get some funding for services? She was challenging the lack of understanding of people that are trafficked domestically, but not internationally across the border. Things are not always what they seem. For example, Jody Williams co-author of a chapter in this new book, uh, Prostitution and Trafficking in Nevada, uh, has devoted her life, uh, herself a survivor, she's devoted her life to helping women escape prostitution. And she, she was on a talk show uh, with a famous pimp and women who he prostituted in his brothel. And the women on the air spoke glowingly of how wonderful prostitution was, how much money they were making, how rich they were getting, and how glamorous a lifestyle it was. At the end of the show, one of the women crept over, and Jody, of course, was the only person on the panel who was in disagreement with that perspective of prostitution and trafficking. At the end of the show, a woman crept, crept over to her, as the pimp was talking to the talk show host and posturing as pimps will do. Um, and she whispered to Jody, get me out of here. Where's your car? Let's get in it as fast as I can. 
She left her purse there. She left all her ID there. She left her jacket there. And Jody whisked her away. And in the limo on the way to Jody's hotel, the woman said, he's got a gun. We're terrified of him. If we don't say exactly what he wants us to say, we could get hurt or killed. So look beneath the surface. Under duress from pimps or traffickers, women hide their coerced status in prostitution just as they do in religious cults and as children hide their abused status from neighbors and teachers. Even hiding their status sometimes from people who offer to help because there have been so many betrayals in their lives, nobody is safe to them. Certainly, Johns who buy women in prostitution cannot tell if she's been trafficked or not, cannot tell if she's under pimp control or not. The job is about acting, and it's about mind control, and any of us who thinks, and I've been in this field for about 13 years now just studying prostitution and trafficking, if any of us thinks we can tell who is or who is not a trafficking victim, then I'd like to know about it because I can't tell. And most people can't. And for us to be spending precious time in these fine discriminations rather than addressing the needs of the vast majority of people, something like 80 to 90 percent, who desperately want out of prostitution, out of trafficking situations. That's where we need to be focusing our energy. Just like the, the uh, you could describe the, the scenario on the talk show as a cover narrative that camouflages the true nature of a human rights violation. Many years ago in the U.S., slavery had a cover narrative just like that. The level of psychological coercion, sexual abuse, community and familial neglect were carefully concealed by this women, just the way uh, people who were enslaved in the U.S. were not always forthcoming about what their experiences were when they were under the hand of the plantation owner. How can we ignore what's right in front of us? How can we ignore what's being advertised in the lobby downstairs at the Mitchell Brothers? How can we look at people doing what we would never want to do, have performed sex acts with five to 20 anonymous strangers a day and conclude, oh, that particular 20-year-old really loves what she's doing? What I would remind you of is that it takes a village to create a prostitute, and we're that village, those of us in this room. You can't have a sex industry the size of San Francisco's, the size of Las Vegas's, without the complicity of all of us. And that includes not just traffickers and the pimps that we see, but politicians, funders, um, police officers, immigration officials. It's a systemic thing. I was in a, a workshop this morning on ethics and interrogation, and uh, Phil Zimbardo was making exactly that point about torture. The same is true of prostitution and trafficking. It's a matter of words. We know, for example, that the word enhanced interrogation is used to conceal torture. We know that the word healthy forest initiative is used to conceal the fact that forests are being clear-cut or cut down in dangerous ways. Similarly, we don't know yet that when prostitution is defined as work, sex work, that's the same thing. It's concealing the real nature of the harm that's being perpetrated right in front of us and that in some ways we may even be complicit with. As Judy Herman said some years ago, most of us find it hard to believe how bad it really is. Pimps and traffickers count on people's ignorance and their refusal to believe their senses, even though these are all ads that are taken from the yellow pages 
clearly advertising prostitution, clearly illegal, and yet people act as if it's hard to find trafficking victims. Well, they're being advertised and sold right in front of us, and that's an important thing to know. Um, because we still know little in this field, we're vulnerable to thinking inside the conceptual and legal boxes that are constructed for us by politicians, lawyers, and perpetrators. We can't any longer afford to be limited by somebody else's definition of what the problem is. As psychologists, we look for evidence-based phenomena. We must reject definitions and demographics foisted on us by politically driven government organizations or by the false memory syndrome or by biased scientists who tell us that global heating doesn't really exist. Psychologists can't let politicians decide what torture is or is not. We can't let the false memory syndrome decide what incest is or is not. And we cannot let the pimp lobby tell us that prostitution is work. And the only people we should be focusing on are, for example, children that are trafficked with a gun to their head from Romania. Yes, that's important, of course but that's not the only group of people harmed. Now there's an evolving public awareness about the human rights violations of sex trafficking in Nevada and other places in the US. Unfortunately, the awareness seems to focus on just on people who've crossed an international border. And I would remind you that although physical violence occurs in that situation, there's psychosocial coercion that happens in contexts of sex and race inequality and under conditions of poverty or extreme financial stress with a great, oftentimes, almost always a history of childhood abuse and neglect. Women may legally or seemingly voluntarily migrate from a poor to a wealthier part of town or a poor to a wealthier part of the world under the promise of a good friend who turns out to be a trafficker. But once she's away from home, once she's migrated any distance, and that can include Richmond to San Francisco, uh, the pimp traffickers psychological and, and physical coercion expands and her options shrink. Domestic and international trafficking have similar adverse effects on victims. The psychological harms of trafficking and prostitution are much the same as women who are, for example, in legal brothels but who haven't crossed a border. The apparently civilized transaction between elite prostitutes and their clients in luxury hotels is underpinned by the same logic that underpins the forcible sale of girls in a Bangladeshi brothel. The logic is premised on a value system that grades girls, boys, and women according to their sexual value. The economic and social forces that channel young, poor, and ethnically marginalized women into prostitution are evident in post-Katrina New Orleans. Survivors of prostitution and advocates for homeless teens in Las Vegas have reported that in the two years following the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, many young women previously pimped were moved, domestically trafficked, to Las Vegas. New Orleans, an economically stressed area with a long history of race discrimination, was the source region for young, poor African-American girls. Las Vegas, with its thriving sex businesses, was the domestic traffickers' destination market for the girls. We live in a world where women are increasingly channeled into prostitution as their opportunities for work in other sectors of the economy shrink. There's really a pyramid-like hierarchy in prostitution. At the top are a very few women who service 
a few men for a lot of money in a short period of time in their lives, and then they get out. In the middle are women who need the money, who have, the, who have often been sexually exploited as children, and who've, who've had the option of sexual exploitation as a survival mode made very, very clear to them as children, and then who may face an emergency situation like a violent partner, losing a job, or having children with special needs. The further you descend in this hierarchy, the greater the numbers of women in prostitution and the less meaningful any discussion of choice is for them. These are the poorest women and women who have enormously restricted life choices at the bottom. Most of these women have been physically coerced into prostitution. The theory that some women choose prostitution ignores the facts that women do not have equal rights with men and that people who are marginalized because of ethnicity or race are discriminated against in the U.S. Choice depends on the freedom to choose. The lowest earning workers in most cultures are single women raising children. And in 2005, a minimum wage full-time worker in the U.S., could not afford an average price one-bedroom apartment anywhere in this country. As a woman in a Nevada legal brothel patiently told me, no one likes to be sold for sex, whether it's legal or illegal, indoors or outdoors, in a gentleman's club or in a gentleman's car. Yet wherever there's prostitution, the pimp and John's debate flames up about whether women in prostitution really like it, whether they consent, whether it's voluntary. Pimps bait us with the myth that there's a vast gulf between what they call freely chosen prostitution and the physically coerced trafficking of women and children. But is there really such a huge difference, or are some forms of coercion simply more visible than others? How do you know what's behind the mask of a smiling 23-year-old who's stripping and turning tricks in the VIP lounge of the strip club? What was her life like before she started prostituting? How many people early on defined her as a little whore when she was sexually abused as a child by family and neighbors? Did she recently escape a violent husband or partner? Did she have children to support and no job that pays enough? Was she unable to, was she unable to afford to go to college? Was she, for whatever reason, economically and emotionally vulnerable and then tricked and brainwashed by a pimp? This is an advertisement for a legal brothel in Nevada, which is advertising across state lines for, um, for recruits in Portland, Oregon. Now, you would think this is an advertisement by a trafficker to recruit people into his brothel, but the fact that it's legal uh, means that um, both federal and local law enforcement or haven't been able to prosecute this guy who's all over the U.S. with recruitment. Um, so for many, many reasons, people sometimes choose what's deeply harmful to them. Sometimes because they've grown up seeing themselves in a limited or damaged way. Remember that for many years, even psychologists considered battered women to be freely returning to their batterers because they had masochistic personality tendencies. And it's only within the last 10 or 15 years that, that uh, we've managed to get rid of that myth. In fact, they were terrorized into returning, just as women are terrorized into returning to pimps who call up youth shelters and tell them, get back out there, or I'm coming in there and getting you. Our culture itself, as the APA's recent report on the sexualization of girls indicates, the very culture we live in limits women's ability to reject the consent to prostitution that's taken for granted. 
A woman in Lusaka, Zambia, told me, Yes, I made the choice to prostitute. My children are hungry and I have to feed them. A woman in West Bengal, India, said that she prostituted because it was better pay for what she was expected of her in her last job anyway. In, in her cultural environment and her work environment, women were expected to tolerate sexual harassment if they wanted to keep the job. And in 2003, Juliana Beasley interviewed and photographed U.S. lap dancers who said pretty much the same thing as the Indian woman did. And this is a quote. Many dancers I interviewed spoke of harassment working in so-called straight jobs. Their attitude was, if I'm going to be sexually objectified, I might as well get paid for it. So women in U.S. prostitution joke about the welfare-to-prostitution trend that has occurred subsequent to the removal of government-assisted educational programs, job training, housing, and child care. Women are, in fact, channeled into prostitution by the actions of politicians who remove public supports by deciding which war they're going to send our tax money to, and shutting down essential social services, which defund housing programs and educational opportunities for the poor, and who vote to eliminate food subsidies for children. Most discussions of consent erase the fact that prostitution is sexually exploitive. Whether or not an individual woman is able to decrease prostitution's physical damage, whether she has relatively more or less money as backup protection, and whether or not she's protected from STDs by the John's use of a condom. Prostitution is nonetheless harmful. Consent isn't a meaningful, it is not a meaningful concept when a woman acquiesces to prostitution out of fear, despair, and a lack of alternatives. In prostitution, as in trafficking, the conditions that make genuine consent possible are absent physical safety, equal power with buyers, and real alternatives. The pimp's defense is usually, well, she consented to prostitution. Traffickers offers us the lie that women consent to trafficking. While women may initially consent to prostitution, they rarely know how bad it's going to be, and they never know the prison-like or slave-like circumstances in which they'll be prostituted. One trafficker who operated illegal brothels in 13 states, including Nevada, was arrested for transporting women from Latin America into prostitution. After his arrest, he argued in court that he gave the women cell phones and he let them keep some of their earnings and that they had some period of freedom. He claimed the women consented. But what did they consent to? to being coerced to turn a dozen tricks a day in exchange for having a cell phone, a few dollars, and some pimp-specified amount of freedom? Two international agreements confront the flawed notion that women freely consent to prostitution, and they make very clear statements about prostitution and trafficking. The first is the UN 1949 Convention, which opposes prostitution and trafficking and states that they're incompatible with human dignity and worth. worth. The U.S. has not signed on to the 1949 UN Convention. Among a few other documents we haven't signed on to. Um, this convention addresses the harm of prostitution and trafficking to consenting adult women, whether or not they were transported across a border. A second, more recent UN document views trafficked women as victims and not criminals. The 2000 Palermo Protocol, like the 1949 Convention, declares that consent is irrelevant 
to whether or not trafficking has occurred. It encourages states, the U.S., Mexico, Canada, to develop legislative responses to men's demand for prostitution. For example, we could charge buyers with felonies instead of jaywalking level of offenses. Sweden has done that. They have almost stopped all trafficking into the country by going after the root of the problem, the demand. Incidentally, Sweden does not criminalize women in prostitution. It's a great law. And New York is coming along right behind it. They've got a law that bumped up penalties on Johns. So, the, and so we, we can prosecute traffickers, organized criminals, and even some pimps who have small organizations are prosecutable under that convention. So I will stop a little early, and um, thank you, Steve, thank for inviting you. me. Thank you, Dr. Farley.